So a while back, there were a lot of headlines. If you were to read them, you'd think that uh, objects in the early universe would evolve in slow motion. Specifically, five times slower. This is based on the results of a study published in Nature Astronomy. I mean, that's, that's what I thought as well. But it turns out it's a bit more complicated than that. They appear to evolve in slow motion, but they're not actually evolving in slow motion at the same time. If you could fill the universe with clocks and you could see those clocks out into you know, infinite space, as you look out at the clocks, of course, firstly, they would look smaller because they're further away. And then secondly, we would see the clocks run more slowly compared to my clock today. So I spoke with astrophysics professor Geraint Lewis from the University of Sydney. He's the author of the study that I mentioned earlier. And it is a study that found more evidence for what's called cosmological time dilation. So when Einstein published his general relativity equations back in the early 20th century, physicists have theorized that in an expanding universe, two things would appear to happen to faraway objects. One, their light would essentially redshift. And what that means is that the wave part of light, you know, light is both a particle and a wave, that wave would get stretched out as it travels towards Earth, changing color in the process or lose it entirely. And whatever emitted that light would also appear to be in slow motion. So plenty of evidence was found for redshifting and the universe expanding within a couple of decades after Einstein published his equations. But for cosmological time dilation, that was much harder to prove. It would be very nice if we had clocks all over the universe, right? It turns out there is. This, this was something that was realized back in the 1920s and 1930s, and they already realized the kind of object that people would want to look at. And they, they predicted that a particular kind of exploding star, a supernova, right? Uh, it's a star that brightens very quickly. It's an explosion, but then fades away over a certain period of time. A supernova is what happens at the end of a star's life. It explodes gloriously. A common way for that to happen is when a star fuses matter, fuses atoms, to the point where it's no longer getting enough energy to resist the pressure of gravity. Usually, that's uh, iron. Once you get to iron, it's bad news for you if you are a star. Uh, but that's not really a great way to check for cosmological time dilation because those kinds of supernovae, they tend to be inconsistent. One very consistent supernova is a type 1a supernova, and it is a supernova that involves the merger of two stars. One of them is a white dwarf. So it was realized is that um, in the local universe, these things got bright and then faded away over a period of, say, you know, three weeks, right? And so throughout the um, early 2000s, people were looking at these supernova out into the universe, looking, let's say, roughly halfway back to the Big Bang. And they were seeing how long did it take for these supernova to brighten and fade, brighten and fade, brighten and fade. And what they find, of course, is that the more distant supernova they see, the longer it takes to go through this cycle of brightening and fading. So the most distant supernova they saw actually took twice as long to do that as a supernova that we see in the local universe. So the further you look into the universe, the more that you're looking at the past until you're staring at the Big Bang. So what if you looked at supernovae type 1a that are more than halfway in distance or time to the Big Bang? Would you see them explode three times slower? five times, 10 times slower. The issue is today's instruments aren't really capable of getting good quality data of supernovae type 1a that are too far away because the light that gets to Earth is just too faint to get any kind of good results. So you'd need something that's much, much brighter. In fact, you'd need the brightest thing in the universe. Some of the most noticeable are these objects called quasars. Now, quasars were discovered in the 1960s, and people have come to realize that they are supermassive black holes, so black holes with masses of millions to billions of times the mass of the sun, and they have material swirling around them at close to the speed of light. So that material gets very hot, glows very brightly, 
And some of the most distant objects that we can see in the universe are these objects called quasars. The problem with quasars, though, is that they tended to vary more than supernovae type 1a. And, you know, physicists have thought that they're not exactly very good clocks to prove that cosmological time dilation has been happening in the early universe as well. Depending on where the light of a quasar has been emitted close to the black hole or far away from the black hole, the light is going to have different wavelengths. And there are quasars that are a thousand times brighter than other quasars. But what Professor Grain did is that he basically had a larger sample size to find a pattern in the variability, around 200 quasars. And after looking at that pattern, it turns out that quasars are good clocks to find out if cosmological time dilation has been happening in the early universe as well. We were seeing them run basically five times slower than nearby quasars. And with the Vera Rubin Observatory, we're about to get a much larger sample size. Think hundreds of thousands of quasars instead of just 200. And once we study the uh, data from those quasars and we find even further proof of cosmological time dilation, then we can safely say that the further you look into the universe, the more objects would appear to be redshifted and they would move in slow motion at the same rate. And in fact, in theory, if I could see, see all the way back to the Big Bang, the, the Big Bang would be, would be frozen. There would be no time passing at that point. There would be an infinite amount of time dilation. How much you'd see an object be in slow motion and how much its light would redshift is directly proportional to how far away it is in distance or time from you to the Big Bang. So if you look at something that's on Earth, then there is barely any time dilation and uh, its light would not redshift. If you are looking at something that's halfway in distance or time to the Big Bang, then what you do is you take one and you divide it by one minus half or 0 0.5. And that object would appear to you two times slower and a slight would redshift by two times as well. If you have something that's, say, three quarters of the way uh, to the Big Bang, then again, one divided by one minus three quarters or 0 0.75 and that object to you would appear four times slower and slight with redshift by four times as well and this keeps going up and up and up until you're basically dividing by zero this is a consequence of einstein's general theory of relativity if we live in an expanding universe what that means is that the curvature of the universe back then is different to the curvature of the universe today. And that influences the way that clocks work when you compare a clock over there to a clock here. But that doesn't mean that objects that are far away are actually evolving in slow motion. It's all relative. It depends on who's doing the measurement. If you are looking at a galaxy that's halfway in distance or time to the Big Bang, then first of all, you're looking at that galaxy in the past, around 7 billion years in the past and you'd see it evolve around two times slower as well but for someone in that galaxy they are looking at our galaxy the milky way seven billion years in the past and it's our galaxy that's appearing two times slower there's a reason it's called general relativity when this story came out i had to speak to a lot of the media and they don't understand time at all. So it was a difficult concept to get across. I think that I think the, the misconception people have is when you say time ran slower in the early universe, they think that if they were there, everything would be in slow motion with respect to them without them realizing that that slow motion applies to everything about them, to the, the speed of their thoughts, to their heart rate and all of it. So they wouldn't see any different, right? It's not like you would be there and you'd be in some sort of slow motion movie. Um, the experience would be the same. So I think that's the biggest misconception people have. But um, I'm, I'm okay with that. I mean, I teach uh, general relativity to my, my honors class here, the fourth year university class. And it's clear, you know, that getting your head around what time is, is not, not an easy question, especially if you're if you're a journalist and have never thought about it, then, it, you know, it, it's not surprising that it's difficult. 
Thank you very much for watching and please check out the full interview with Professor Grant in the description. Yes. Again, I see it. You found the flower? Can I, I see it? Thank you. You found this flower? Hmm? Can, can you say cosmological time dilation? Hmm? All right.